Hi everyone, so today I wanted to take the first step on a journey where I go over every single raid speedrun world record and kind of discuss the strategies that are being used in them for a casual audience. So you, I'm sure you guys know I make a lot of speedrunning guides if you are a speedrunner yourself and you want to learn how to do strategies, but that's not as appealing to a more mainstream audience. So I wanted to make more entertainment value focused content on speedrunning where it's kind of like a watch along where you can watch like a world record speedrun like the one we're about to watch today and you can kind of appreciate it more because you understand more of what's going on without necessarily going into so much detail that it becomes kind of overbearing. So I'm going to go chronologically. We're going to start with Last Wish today. We'll move on to Garden, etc, etc. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this and, um, you know, let me know if you have any questions about uh, the kind of process that we're going through here. But yeah, I'm just going to basically take you through a speedrunner's perspective of uh, all of the raid world records. So let's start with Last Wish and um, yeah, let's take a look at this run. I also have some new markup tools that I'm excited to possibly use. So um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be possibly using those. Okay. Let's start with entrance. So, last wish entrance. Uh, it's done a little bit non-standard from most raid entrances. Uh, there is an out of bounds area that you can use to basically skip the entire starting section where Ribbon kind of opens that door when she's done talking with you. You can go basically straight to the Kali load zone uh, where the Kali encounter starts. So half the team is going to go through this wall and do something that's called a quick load, which I'll explain in a second. And if we go back in the video, you'll notice that the other half of the team, we pause right over here, you'll see that the other half of the team is over here, right? So these three hunters, because they have access to shatter skating right now, they take a different entrance route that is faster than the rest of the team, which will preload the Kali encounter area much faster so that everybody else can have just a faster time getting to the encounter. So there, you might be wondering, you know, why are these guys going all the way in here instead of just kind of going out of bounds through the right wall, which they're about to do? Well, um, there's a checkpoint here that needs to be hit by every single individual player. And the players that go through left side naturally hit this checkpoint, but these players have to actually, you know, go here because if you go through the right side, you don't hit the checkpoint by default. So that's why they're going in here instead of just immediately going um, for their entrance. So yeah, that is that. Let's move on here. And so I mentioned that these players are all going to do something called quick loading. Now, if you don't know what quick loading is, quick loading is essentially whenever you hit a load zone from a odd angle or from a specific location like so, you'll see that Seiyun has just hit a load zone there. If the game doesn't know where to spawn you or there's no valid corresponding position between the two load zones that you just moved from, then the game will just spawn you in the default spawn of that load zone instead. Now, if you're not familiar with what the, what the word load zone is, I'm going to use it a lot in this explanation, most likely. Um, the game, Destiny 2's activities are generally split up into load zones to reduce resource load when you're playing the game. So if, as you move from section to section, when you see in the bottom left hand corner of your screen a new location name, generally speaking, you've entered a new load zone. So the Tower of Opened Eyes is the Kali load zone, and you'll see that Seiyun has just managed to hit it from going out of bounds and hitting that kind of black region, and she's instantly spawned here, and that's what a quick load is. So the hunters also did that on the right side, kind of a similar process. So you might have noticed at this point in the video that we have a certain someone, Takaroko, in the top right hand corner of the screen here, and they appear to be not at Kali, but rather somewhere out of bounds underneath the map. And so the reason for this is because Kali in speedrunning is actually done as a five man. And one person is actually sent ahead to skip to Shuro ahead of time so that the second Kali ends, everybody gets pulled to Shuro. And so you might be wondering, well, you know, why are they kind of under the map? Why are they not going to Shuro immediately? And that is because, sorry, I keep pressing escape to close my drawing tool and it closes YouTube. But that's because you'll see Uzi here in a second swords the flag over into a weird position. Why would you not just place the flag there? That's because only through this kind of region can Takaroko the skipper rally through the floor so that he can get his well so that he can do his skip much faster. Everyone else here is just going to kind of do the encounter pretty normally. And um, we'll talk briefly about two things when it comes to the Kali encounter itself, and then we'll talk about the skip that's going on in the top right. So you'll notice that Seiyun is on Necrotic Grip. If you notice, the hand was kind of green. Seiyun is on Necrotic Grip, and that is to trap Kali. Uh, the reason why you trap Kali, if you've done a Kali farm before, is to just keep her fixated at one plate so that she doesn't teleport back to mid or move away, so that you can just kill her without actually going into her normal DPS phase. And the way that you do this is just by applying a damage over time effect to Kali while she is deciding what plate to go to. 
So right now, actually, Callie has teleported away, and she's currently deciding what plate to go to. She's going to go to Uzi's plate because he's the only one that's on a plate right now, so she's going to be attracted to him. And while she's deciding that, as long as there is a damage over time effect that's occurring on her, then she'll teleport to that plate and be trapped there as long as continuous damage is applied to her. So, um, I mentioned that Seiyun is on Necrotic Grip. A lot of you are probably familiar with Anarchy, but any damage over time effect works. And you can see that the um, kind of damage ticks are occurring on Seiyun's uh, cross hair. Okay, so we're going to move to Kali damage here. Now, Kali does have a special precision multiplier. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. All tech units in the game kind of have the same precision multiplier. You do two times uh, damage to the head that you do to the body normally. And um, so a lot of, you know, precision weapons are going to be used in the first two encounters in this raid. Izanagi's Burden, Heritage, like Slug Shotguns, Golden Gun, that sort of thing is all really, really great at melting Kali. And so that's what they're using here. Now, the last thing I'll talk about when it comes to Kali is you might have noticed that everybody just kind of stops attacking her for a short period of time and then she teleports away and comes back if you've ever if you've ever done a cali farm before i'm sure you've realized that if you just continuously do damage to her you never actually end up killing her until she goes to mid she just sits there and immediately you know just re repeatedly tanks your damage with a completely empty health bar so you have to let cali uh, you know tp away and then come back and that's why people don't really use like stuff like um, anarchy or wither horde on cali during damage uh in a speed run so that's the final thing I'm going to talk about with Kali. I mean, they're going to make some special finishers here, but there's nothing much else in the encounter that's going on. So let's actually talk about the skip instead. So a lot of people, when they watch uh, Last Wish speedruns, they kind of focus on what's going on in Kali. When in reality, when it comes to what the speedrun is gated to at that period of time, uh, it's actually the skip. Now, what do I mean by gating? Gating is another kind of speedrun term. And it refers to what is actually going to cut your time off when it comes to uh, the timing of a certain segment, right? When it comes to the progression of the raid, what actually matters? So Kali here, you might think, okay, well, Kali's an encounter. Obviously, we have to finish the encounter to do the raid quickly. Um, in reality, when Kali is dying here, you'll see that Kali is about to die. The skipper, Takaroko, is actually nowhere near Shirochi, right? And that's kind of by the design of this strat, right? Um, you know, this skip is very, very important. And so the actual speed of the Kali encounter doesn't really matter. It's uh, rather more important how fast the skip makes it to Shirochi. So there is a kind of planned strategy here where you replace the Warlock who is doing Takaroko's role with a Hunter. And that Hunter doesn't actually need the flag at all because you can Shatter Skate obviously without um, rallying and you don't need your super for that. So that's going to save about 10 seconds on that skip, which will in turn have to change the Kali kill to be faster so that it's still being gated to that skip. Okay, um, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about Shirochi next. So uh, I kind of said this before, but Last Wish is kind of interesting in terms of encounter structure because uh, it has like a it has about half boring encounters and half interesting encounters when it comes to a speedrunning perspective, uh, and they kind of alternate. So you have like Kali, Morgith, and you have Riven, which are all relatively uninteresting encounters. Uh, Kali is kind of just you know you just kill a boss. Morgith is like you pick up some strengths, you cleanse, you kill a boss, and then Riven is like you send and then you kill a boss, right? So very very straightforward. Whereas Shuro is a more movement and mechanic focused encounter. Uh, you have Vault, which is also a more ad clear and mechanic focused encounter. And then you have Queen's Walk, which is, of course, a uh, very famously movement focused encounter in speedrunning. So kind of interesting. We're going to move into Shuro here. You're going to notice I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about Shuro because the strategies are a lot more diverse and interesting. So right off the bat, the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to Shuro is um, Shuro basically if you want her to spawn more ads and progress the encounter and move forward through the encounter, you have to kill a certain percentage of all of the ads that are alive in the encounter at a given time. So for example, obviously as soon as you open the door, there's a bunch of Taken that spawns. If you've spawned, if you farm Shuro for like a catalyst or like weapon leveling before they change that, you're probably familiar with this already, but you can't progress. There will be no more ad spawns until you kill almost all of the ads in the initial ad spawn, right? So every time you get an ad spawn with knights in Shuro, you have to make sure that, let's say, you know, Shuro checks for 90% of the ads uh, that she's just spawned to be dead before she spawns in the next wave. You need to make sure that the knights are within the 90% and not the 10% that remain whenever you kill a wave in Shirochi. And the reason for that is if you ever leave a knight alive, on the plate, there's going to be an additional spawn of ads. We call it a double spawn. There's going to be an additional spawn of ads, which slows down the encounter. So you'll notice here, Takaroko in the top right, if we take a look at his POV, right? I'm going to skip forward a little bit here or skip backward a little bit. I mean, 
you might be wondering, you know, why isn't he just instantly shooting Galley the second the ad spawn? He's actually trying to identify the knight grouping, and the reason for that is if he instantly shot Galley just kind of in the middle of all the ads, there is a chance that he leaves a knight alive and you get a double spawn on the plate. So he is just taking his time looking for that knight spawn and killing all the ads afterward, right? So that's kind of how that works. That spawn is the most unpredictable knight spawn. It can be in one of like six different places. Uh, in the other spawns that you'll see throughout the rest of the encounter, they're basically completely predictable. So there's no waiting going on. You can just pre-shoot Galley at where they spawn. So moving on, we have Shirochi here. Um, now this is another strategy that this team kind of innovated. Now, in previous years, people kind of realized that occasionally, seemingly randomly, Shirochi will just spawn the next adds while you're doing a break. So this is a break where you like lower her shield. Um, Shirochi will occasionally, seemingly randomly, just spawn in the adds after her damage uh, early, before her damage is even over, right? And so this team did some testing and they found out that if you allow Shirochi to boop you right as you break her shield, the adds will start spawning after her, even if you haven't completed the damage phase, right? So you're going to take a look here and they're doing a break right now, right? Takaroku gets booped right as the break happens and you'll see, well, I can't, you can't really see in, in Saiyan's POV here, but you'll see that the adds have already started spawning in and they barely just finished damage, right? So that is what early adds is and it's done on the first break on each floor. So the first and second floor. And then here you'll see the same thing. Takaroko is doing the exact same thing. They're targeting the knights and then they're getting rid of the adds at the same time. So one more thing you've probably noticed at this point in the video is that in the top right, two people are not participating in the ad clear or damage section of the encounter. What are they doing? Well, they're doing something called pre-plating. You might have seen this in like a wish LFG if you've done a wish LFG recently with more experienced players. What pre-plating is, is essentially you get on the plate and through a series of getting on and off at specific times, you can trick it into thinking that there has a player on it permanently. There's a player just sitting there permanently. And so what Uzi and Takaroko are doing in this top right POV is that they're pre-plating all nine plates. And so when Shirochi's second damage starts, you'll see in the bottom left here in just a second, Shirochi's tempos resumes, and then you'll see three command accepts instantly, right? So the game actually thinks that there are nine players or there's a player on every single plate because they've pre-plated. In previous versions of Last Wish speedrun strats, uh, there used to be a thing that people used to do called washing where you would simulate having a player on all nine plates by having five players slide in a specific way around the puzzle but this is a lot faster right because these people can just go straight to the next floor and um you know there's no rng or like connection based anything it's just all nine plates are instantly activated so that is another cool strat from shirochi uh much more interesting than kali i'm sure you agree and then now we'll get to see Seiyun do the exact same thing that Takaroko did on the first floor here on the third break. And that's going to be doing early ads, but this time we'll actually get a first person perspective instead of seeing it from the sidelines. You'll see Seiyun is floating above Shiro to get her attention and boom, gets booped right as damage starts. And you'll see the ads just spawn in nice and early right there. Okay. So that is pretty much it for Shirochi. I mean, the, the third floor has another strategy that I'm going to continue talking about, but the second floor is largely the same as the first floor. You'll see that, uh, like I mentioned, Shirochi is a Tekkian, so they are using precision weapons. And as such, every single on the second and fourth break, so the last break of the first and second floor, they also use a golden gun to instantly send her and instantly do her entire health bar for that phase. And the reason for that is because the second and fourth breaks uh, their damage matters a lot more because how quickly you kill her determines how quickly she goes up to the next floor. Whereas on the first and second break, you're waiting for the adds to spawn in anyway, so your damage speed doesn't matter as much. So on the final floor here, we're going to see largely the same thing, right? I mean, it's just kind of killing the adds, making sure the knights die first. And the last strategy that this team kind of implemented in Shirochi is early crystals. And so I talked to Takaroko about this yesterday and the way early crystals essentially works is you leave a specific blight. So obviously all the taken that Shiro spawns in, they spawn in these little clusters called blights and you leave one of the acolyte spawns alive. And as the plate adds spawn in, you kill them. And um, I suppose the game thinks that you've killed the plate adds rather than killing a random group of acolytes from beforehand. And so it thinks you've met the requirements, the ad kills required to spawn in the crystals and then it spawns them in so you can do your break right away. So you can see here, those plate ads just spawned in. Some of them are even still alive, and yet they're already breaking her to do damage. So early crystals, a little bit of time save uh, on the third floor here. So let's go ahead and continue here. This is the final floor. And now you might be wondering, 
This is a world record. Why did Sayun just place her well of radiance in the middle of the floor? Is this a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. The reason for this is because all of the hunters are on Golden Gun throughout the duration of this encounter, but they need to be on stasis, and specifically, they need to have a Glacier Grenade for the transition section after this encounter. And you might be wondering, okay, why do they need a Glacier Grenade for the next section? And we'll talk about that in just a second, but essentially what the Warlocks are doing is because they don't need their wells to well skate in the next section, they offer them up to the hunters, they give them orbs, and through mods like, you know, Absolution and Innervation, the hunters can get their grenade energy back so that they have Glacier Grenades for the transition section that comes up next. So here, you know, we can kind of skip past this. This is more of the same that you've seen before. Kill the knights, nuke the knights, maybe get early crystals and uh, do some damage with precision weapons here. Nothing too crazy. You know, our health bar disappears in a flash. And now we are going to move on to the Shiro to Morgeth transition section. So here you're going to notice something a little bit interesting, right? So first of all, obviously the Warlocks don't have wells. Right, so why do they not have wells? Isn't going fast important for a transition section where you're you're going from encounter to encounter? Well, not for this one. You're gonna see here in just a second, as soon as Seiyun hits that load zone, you didn't you didn't really see the text there, she just dies instantly. And why is this? So you'll see here that in a second, when Seiyun respawns, she's actually skipped almost the entirety of the transition. I would say like two thirds of the transition. She's just skipped and now she is suddenly at Morgeth, and so is the rest of her team. So how did this happen? Well, this is a speedrun technique called default spawn manipulation. And the way that it works, well, we're only gonna find out once we watch someone else's POV. We're gonna watch Alodian's POV here. So we're gonna skip over to the end of Shirochi. And like I mentioned, you'll see that Alodian has uh, his grenade. He has his glacier grenade, right? Izzy's the boss, we're gonna skip over here. And you'll notice that ahead of everyone else leading the pack is Synth and Alodian. And what are they doing? Well, they're throwing their glacier grenades at a very precise location. They're throwing it right in this nice little box here, right? Let's draw a little box. They're throwing it in this nice little box here. And the reason for that is if you look at, I did not mean to do that. Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, if you look at this, they've just hit a new load zone. They, In fact, they've hit the Morgith load zone, right? And so what they're doing is at the, in every single load zone in Destiny 2, right? We've talked about load zones before. In every single load zone in Destiny 2, just in case if you've set your spawn somewhere and your spawn is dangerous or the game can't res you there because there's an object blocking it or something like that, the game needs a default spawn to throw you just in case your spawn is dangerous or blocked, right? So that let's say, you know, you die and then like a Goliath tank is covering your spawn or you just enter a load zone and you die and, you know, there's your, your spawn just hasn't been set yet. The game needs somewhere to put you and that's called a default spawn. So naturally, the default spawn for the Morgith load zone, it makes sense for it to be at the start of the transition, at the start of the load zone, because the load zone boundary is right here. However, some load zones have a fallback spawn. And so what is a fallback spawn? That means if your default spawn is blocked by something and you haven't set your spawn anywhere, it will alternate to a new fallback spawn, a new default spawn that could be in a different place. And it just so happens that in this transition, in this Morgith load zone, the fallback spawn is actually just at the Morgoth encounter. So what you do here is, as you enter the load zone, you'll see uh, Alarion has entered the Keep of Voices load zone. He takes gentle care to not touch the ground for too long to set his spawn. He's bouncing up and down, and he throws a crystal, and so he hasn't set his spawn, and the game can't spawn him in the normal default spawn of this load zone. So he actually just teleports to the next load zone, or sorry, not to the next load, not to the next load zone, but rather the fallback spawn. So that's kind of what, uh, that's kind of the entire reason why the glacier grenades were saved up and uh, converted using the Well of Radiance orbs. And now someone just slides backward to hit a checkpoint uh, from coming out of the portal from Morgoth. Normally there's a checkpoint there uh, that you need to hit to start the encounter. And once that happens, remote just goes over here and starts the encounter instantly. Okay. So like I mentioned before, right, um, Last Wish kind of has alternating encounters, right? You have some boring encounters, you have some interesting encounters. Morgoth is a pretty boring encounter, but the way that it's done is actually in a trio. And the reason for that is in past years, a Morgoth skip was theorized where you could go through the these pushdown barriers in the top left and top right corners of the encounter, go over the wall that is blocking Morgoth off, and you can make your way to vault, skip to vault, and start vault as soon as Morgoth dies. Now, this strategy was never really fully fleshed out until recently, and the way that this works now is the Hunters do Trio Morgoth by themselves, and the Warlocks, they use Needlestorm to propel themselves over these pushdown barriers, make it to Vault, and they start Vault instantly the second Morgoth dies. So, we're gonna go ahead and watch this. Now, the actual encounter Morgoth is pretty boring, even as a trio. There's not that much going on. But let's go ahead and watch these skippers first. 
So as you can see, they're kind of building a, a little ice palace here, right? I think Seiyun has her own crystal lineup, so she uses her, she waits for these to fade and then she does her skip separately from the rest of her team. But the idea is still the same. You use Salvation's Grip to climb all the way to the roof of the encounter. And let me skip a little bit past here. Once you reach the roof of the encounter, you are going to create some crystals that are at the perfect angle for you to use an eager edge sword and a super animation to bypass the pushdown barrier. Now this can be done in a variety of ways. You can do it using silence and squall. You can do it using blade barrage, but the way that it was just done there was just using needle storm. And that's because they are on warlock. Now let's briefly take a look at Morgoth here. And then we're going to talk about what's going on on Saiyan's POV with the warlocks because they do one more thing to actually make their transition on time. So here, the Morgoth kill is very, very simple. It's just Blade Barrage and Parasite. And I believe, yeah, all Radiant switches to Horseman just in case the boss isn't dead, but it looks like the kill is good. The kill is almost as fast as Six Man, so the trio, you know, Trio Morgoth barely loses any time. And instead, you get a wonderful skip to Vault, and you get to skip that entire transition, and everybody gets pulled to Vault. So you might be wondering, how do they get to Vault so fast, right? I mean, it's, it's even if you kind of go over that wall, and um, you traverse the entire vault area, you know, it's a pretty long transition. How did they get there so fast? There is another default spawn manipulation technique used in this run, and that is between Morgoth and Vault. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at Takoroko's POV to show us what's going on here. Oh, wait, no, sorry, this is Elonia's POV. Wrong POV, wrong POV. We're going to go ahead and take a look at Takoroko's POV. So as you can see, whenever the video loads, Takoroko is... You can see here he drops down at the edge of the Morgoth load zone and he actually switches to Salvation's Grip. So obviously he doesn't have any Glacier Grenades, so he switches to Salvation's Grip instead to block off the Vault Transition Load Zone's default spawn. So you see him and Uzi, they're creating this nice little, nice little ice palace over here and he dies and as Seiyun makes it over, they all respawn and boom, they're at Vault and the Vault fallback uh, spawn is actually again in the vault encounter. So last wish is I, I suppose in in speedrunning terms Fortunate enough to have these fallback spawn circumstances in a lot of raids where people try to use this technique The fallback spawns are either not useful or don't exist So last wish is kind of fortunate to have these fallback spawns that are all the way forward in encounters um, So it's pretty unique in that regard. So now let's move to vault now vault is a little bit more of an interesting encounter to speedrun um, there's many encounters in Destiny 2 speedruns, in Raid speedruns specifically, where everybody kind of has to do their own little part. Uh, and Vault is kind of like one of those things. It's like a it's like a neat flowing system where everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And so, first, let's uh, let's start by talking about what's a little bit irregular. So, in Vault here, you see that Takaroko instantly, instead of reading, blinks up and starts clearing ads with his heavy gel. So why is that? Well, okay, this isn't Takaroko actually, this is Seiyun, but Takaroko is essentially doing the same thing. Why do they not read? Well, in this encounter, right, you're not actually gated to reading unless you take so long to read that the third person that dunks is waiting on you. So in this case, you're actually gated to ad clear. Vault is an insanely ad clear gated encounter. You have four spawns of acolytes, and then you have a captain, and then you do that again in two more rooms, and the entire encounter's progression is basically based on how quickly you can kill these adds, and then you're gated to that final third dunk. How quick is that third dunk? So that is the reason why the skippers, they don't read at all. They just go for killing these adds so that they can start and uh, start spawning the adds to spawn in the captains, and the people that get joining allies are actually the ones that read. So. You see over here, they use heavy GLs to make sure that their kills are quick. Oh, <laughs> little little incident on the phalanx there. But as you can see, the three hunters have joined allies at this point, and they are making their way to read and get calls right now. So as you can see, this ad clear is basically you have three ad clears and you have three readers, kind of similar to how it's done in LFG, except the roles are kind of a little bit reversed. And all of these ads are just nuked instantly as quickly as possible. And yeah. So they keep running here. I'm not going to show you the, the first and second dunk because it's essentially the same thing. You just add clear everything in your room and then you insta nuke your captain and then you start, uh, you know, making your way to the middle. Now, what I will show you, though, is the third dunk. Now, the third dunk is a little bit special. And why is it special? It's because the third dunk is what the entire encounter is gated to, right? That's what you're waiting for. That vault security mechanism timer, it doesn't end until you slam the third I have Riven. And when you slam the third Eye of Riven, it triggers the next round. And on the final round, it you know, triggers the end of the encounter. So this entire encounter is hinged on getting this third dunk as quick as possible. And you've probably noticed 
if you kill the third captain and then you try to make your way through the tunnels, you know, adjacent to each, each room, it's kind of slow, right? It's not very fast. You have to kind of walk around these phalanxes and make your way through another room. Instead, what's done in speedrunning is, let me go ahead and mute this. What happens in speedrunning is as these ads are cleared very quickly, there is one person, in this case, in this team, Synth, who switches to an underlight class item so that they can be under power and they switch to tractor cannon. And the way that this works is since they're under power, they don't do any damage to the captain, which means that they can be as close as they want to the captain and use tractor cannon to boop the cannon, uh, not the cannon, to boop the captain into the middle of the room. And so you're going to see here that Takaroko throws an uncharged vortex grenade. That's to suck the captain into a more favorable position for booping. And you'll see that the captain actually just goes flying out of the room. And normally what's done here is you have a warlock on Astrocyte Verse. So Takaroko is in fact on blink right now, just in case this boop doesn't go too well. And you know, you end up somewhere in the middle of the room. You can blink the eye out before the wall fully closes up. But in this case, since boop was very good. So Takaroko was able to just kill it and slide it out and just slam immediately. So Vault is a pretty cool encounter. You know, it's, it's very ad clear based, very, very, it's very player gated. You're not really waiting on stuff during the encounter for the most part. It's very precise. Um, and so yeah, the second round basically transpires in the exact same way. I'm not going to really show you the second round because um, it's the exact same thing. But on the third round, something special does happen. And so we're going to go ahead and switch back to the same POV to talk about what happens at the end of Vault. So at the end of Vault, I want you to notice two things. There's two things that have happened, right? Number one, first, Seiyun is not on Blink anymore. And the reason for that, well, first of all, is because Takaroko is the kind of set blinker for this team. So he is able to blink out no matter what room is last. He is going to be responsible for blinking the captain in case the boop doesn't go super well, right? Now, Seiyun is on Solar. So why is Seiyun on Solar? That's because Seiyun is farming up a well. So you'll see as this encounter progresses, Seiyun is working on getting a well using Sunbracer nades and Ashes to Assets, as you can see. And you'll also see something else that's a little bit special. So on this third round, after Seiyun dunks, or is this third round or second round? I think I may, I think I may have skipped the second round by accident instead of third round. Okay, yeah, this is, I believe this is, yeah, that was second round. So you'll see here on third round, after Seiyun helps out a little bit with these ads, suddenly she goes into her inventory and switches to a sword and decides to leave. And why is this? Well, there isn't a Riven skip, but there is an early transition that you can do. So you can help out a little bit in the encounter. Now, if Sane were to go forward during this point in the encounter, there would be joining allies in this area. So you can't leave right away. But how this works is instead of having the whole team kind of after <laughs> after Volt is over, make their all, you know, six man, make their way to Riven as quickly as possible. Um, these players know when the encounter is going to end. They've done this encounter probably hundreds of times. They know when the encounter is going to end. So what Taco Roka will do is he will call go at a certain point when he knows he's around five seconds away from the encounter ending. And then these two warlocks, Seiyun and Uzi, will instantly start skating towards Riven. And this joining allies timer, it looks a bit freaky, but it disappears because the encounter ends, right? And so they're basically doing an early transition to Riven. And the reason why Seiyun was farming up a well is because they don't stop to get a flag here. So, you know, stopping to get a flag would be time loss. So they instantly just go to their plates and drop down. Okay, so if you're familiar with Riven Cheese, good old Riven Cheese, that is exactly what's done in this encounter in speedrunning. However, there's a small difference, right? Nobody goes to Crystal because everybody is getting joining allies. I'm sure you know that if you stick to the wall in Crystal side in like an LFG Riven, you get joining allies and you get sent to the top. Well, instead, uh, no one is at risk of dropping down the map here because four of the players on this team are getting pulled to Vault. So they're getting joining allies and they get to just sit at the top and wait for the call to see who gets Riven first. The other difference is that one person is going to be responsible for sending Riven. Normally in an LFG, nobody sends because there's a risk for damage and, you know, there's more mechanics to deal with. But sending Riven will allow her to, instead of you're, you're waiting out her entire forgiveness period while she just sits there and flails around and waits for someone to send, if you send, she instantly goes to the other side, which obviously makes a lot of sense for a speedrun. So Seiyun here, they've identified that it's not going to be their side, right? So they're going to be sending, they're not going to be damage side. So we'll see Seiyun here, bait out a claw attack, right? Slide over, use Izzy to instantly send. And then she's going to switch to a rocket after farming up some ammo. And we'll see her do Ascendant. So before we do Ascendant, I'm going to briefly just go to the Takaroko POV. And we'll go ahead and see how Riven damage is done. So like I said, at the end of Vault, everybody gets joining allies to Riven. 
and everybody just spawns up here. It's as if you did that crystal wall joining allies method. Now you get to just sit up here, wait for your teammates to call what side you need to go to. Evidently in this run it was tree, so everybody just makes their way over to tree. And in previous seasons, people used the Lightfall Heavy Waveframe Dimensional Hypo Tricoid to bounce waveframe projectiles off the wall here and do damage to Riven. That was the strat before. However, uh, thanks to some physics interaction changes, that strategy no longer works very well. So the strategy is, as you would expect, just rockets. Uh, as long as you don't aim at her face and you aim at under her chin, uh, this team just uses Surrounded Apex Predator along with Galley from Takaroko and Tractor with his assistance as well, and Star Eater Blade Barrages. And as you can see, the kill is very fast. So that is essentially what's done here. Now, in terms of Ascendant Plane, the Ascendant Plane, there's some interesting tech that is worth noting here. So we'll see Seiyun here. I'm going to skip past this area. And Seiyun actually has a rocket out and is staring at the floor. Why is that? Well, the Danger Zone changes to rockets recently actually allow you to propel yourself with heat rises or, you know, just even without heat rises, propel yourself upwards at a pretty decent speed. And so <clears throat> one of the big problems, one of the big ways actually that speedrunners get height is either through grappling to something like Illumina or like an Illumina projectile or a rocket or by well bouncing off of something. And unfortunately in the Ascendant Plane in Riven, there is no easy well bounce that you can instantly do the second you get teleported in. And when we're talking about just mere seconds here that are worth shaving off to make the encounter as fast as possible, the fastest way that was actually found to get up there and pick up that strength is using Danger Zone Heat Rises uh, launching. So we're going to see Seiyun attempt that right over here. As soon as she gets teleported in, we'll see one teleport, we'll see two teleports. She shoots the ground, she gets some nice height, but unfortunately not enough. But thankfully Uzi is there to save the day and he is able to pick up the strength. The hunters also go for a rocket grapple from what I was told here. Rocket grappling is almost as fast uh, because you're able to instantly do it, unlike Lumina grappling, which will track your teammates if you're nearby them when you get teleported. So um, that's kind of how they do Ascendant Plane very quickly. Okay, finally, we have Final Stand. Final Stand, you know, not much to talk about. It's just uh, some Izzy's, a tractor, and a Nova Bomb from Takaroko. Boom, gone instantly. And um, her second Final Stand, or I suppose her heart, is just done using horsemen, right? Players just sword in at a certain moment when that animation disappears from her mouth, and um, they just horsemen the, uh, the heart. And two horsemen mags is enough, so it seems like Uzi and Taco just finished the job, and that's it for Riven. Now, before we get started on Queen's Walk, you might notice, you know, what are Synth and Remote doing? Are they, uh, are they AFK? You know, why, why aren't they in the throat? Why aren't they helping out? Well, the reason for that is because uh, in order to make the encounter more consistent, this team has for specific roles on specific people. Now, Queen's Walk is a number of things, but number one, you ideally want to have a specific person do skip, right? So you want that person not to be chosen. So that's why Synth is currently alive and not uh, not in the th heart with everyone else. And number two, uh, Queen's Walk involves a lot of sword hits, right? You are right clicking, left clicking your, your teammates with Eager Edge a lot. And, you know, because of connection based circumstances, you may not want to have certain teammates be involved in these hits, which is why I assume they have remote long and outside. He is also out there because he can be on Gallahorn. He can clear all the enemies outside very quickly so that there's nothing for uh, his teammates to die to or to track to while they're hitting people outside the mouth. So let's go ahead and see what goes on here. We'll see as soon as the objective updates, these two players die so that they don't get chosen. And we'll see that as soon as the encounter is started, Remote Login will revive himself when his 5 second timer is up. He's out there right now, galling to his heart's content. Remote, Galley's strongest soldier of course, during the Queen's Walk encounter. And then sadly Remote will pass away <laughs> as he is not needed for the rest of the encounter. Uh, you'll notice though, however, that Synth has not revived himself. Why is that? Well. Synth is waiting until the heart chooses someone here, because obviously if Synth revived early and the heart chose Synth, then, you know, you don't want your skipper to be the one holding the heart. And I mentioned skipper here, well, you know, is there a skip in this encounter? Yes, there is, and I will show you that in just a second. And um, the rest of this encounter plays out pretty much the same. It's just a bunch of people hitting each other with eager edge swords so that the heart is propelled as quickly as possible. There were a couple mishaps here in this run. This run was a pretty good last wish run outside of the Queen's Walk. A couple mishaps here. But besides that, as you can see, they're about to go for their final line here, the kill line, where they send the heart holder all the way to the vault wall. And uh, unfortunately, you know, this taken knight can interfere with that. So what does Saiyan do? Saiyan jumps up, Vortex nades the knight spawn, and Nova bombs it to make sure that it is dead by the time she needs to hit Takaroko to that wall, which she's about to do. She right clicks him, beautiful line there, straight to the corner of the wall. 
and Takaroko will land right at that vault wall. So you might be wondering, why would Takaroko want to go straight down the middle of the map, right, all the way over here, right, instead of maybe over here, over here, where the open doors are? Well, the reason for that is because in Last Wish Speedrunning, this has been a classic for many years. There is a vault skip, even though this is not technically the vault encounter. We are in the vault area. There is a skip where you can actually make it over the wall that separates the center vault chamber from the stairs room. And so I'm going to actually head to the synth POV with its wonderful thumbnail featuring remote login. I'm actually going to head to the synth POV. We're going to head to the end of the run here and we're going to see what synth actually gets up to. So this synth is going to go forward here. And you'll see he grapples right over the wall and makes it over that nice thin slit there and is able to actually pick up the heart through the wall. So there's been many iterations of this strat in the past. Uh, people have used Heat Rises on Warlock to do it. Uh, there was an iteration with this part of this team actually where Synth was on Thunder Crash and with Thunder Crash over the wall on Titan back when a Titan was needed in Last Wish. And now it's just a grapple. It's just a simple nice grapple over the wall. So Synth is going to go ahead and pick up the heart through the wall and jump right over here synth is timing his forward input here at a precise moment so that he gains a nice amount of forward trajectory without bumping into this kind of tunnel that he's going down so right there a nice clean shave and a nice drop to go with it and the heart is dunked and there you go and that is last wish done in 12 minutes and some change and some change so um, I hope that was enjoyable. Uh, you know, Last Wish has quite a few number of strats. This team has been personally responsible for innovating on a lot of the strats that you see here, like implementing Morgan Skip correctly in a run, early crystals, early ads, uh, you know, the danger zone bounce, for example, lots of cool things that this team has come up with. And um, it's safe to say that they've uh, come to bear some nice fruit. Uh, this 1222 is a pretty solid run. In the future, like I mentioned, uh, there might be a faster, uh, you know, skip to Shiro using a hunter, so that that could be save time. Uh, there's also a theorized transition, an early transition to Morgith, where you skip that Shiro to Morgith transition, but even faster with even less people. So that's something that could save time as well. So you know, we very well could see this uh, raid drop below 12 minutes this year, um, which would certainly be interesting as well. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, first yap session out of probably eight since there's eight raids in this game and uh, i'll try to release garden relatively soon but that raid is under a lot of scrutiny right now a lot of changes so maybe we'll wait a little bit and uh, see what happens with that so with that being said um i hope you guys enjoyed if you have any questions or even comments corrections maybe stuff that i left out that maybe i should have explained better or explained in general uh, feel free to let me know and um yeah that's it for last wish in 12 minutes